Beth from the Roosevelt Institute for American Studies and Leiden University. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all this afternoon on um, yeah, quite a steamy uh, afternoon here in the Netherlands um, to our summer guest lecture. And it really gives me great pleasure to, to welcome our guest for today, uh, Professor Petra Hudde, who is literally on site at the Roosevelt Institute with a uh, an FDR uh, statement just behind her head there from the For Freedom speech. Um, it really is a pleasure to have Petra as our visiting professor um, this month up until mid-July. Um, if you go through Petra's CV, you really wonder how many hours she finds in a day to do everything she does, because um, it really is a tremendous uh, list. Um, she is professor of history at Temple University, chair of the Department of History and editor of the front rank journal Diplomatic History, uh, the number one journal in the field. She is also most recently the author of um, this wonderful book, The, the Politics of Peace. So a bit of a reflection there, A Global Cold War History, and uh, which only came out two years ago. And she is preparing now with Akira Iria, uh, one of the giants in the field, uh, a book titled International History, A Cultural Approach, uh, which we're all very much looking forward to. Uh, and that will appear next year. But Petra is with us today to talk about something very contemporary. And the title of her talk is America's Conflicted Relationship with Globalization in the Age of COVID. So we're very curious to hear Petra's take on the current state of American foreign relations in the COVID situation. Um, Petra, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and I pass the word to you. Before that, um, if I could just ask everyone to keep their cameras off. This is because we will be recording the lecture and um, it is better if we record it that we only have Petra and, and her PowerPoint uh, in vision. So um, please, those of you who still have your, your cameras on, uh, if you could turn them off, that would be appreciated. And once Petra is uh, finished with her lecture, uh, we will take our questions. Um, at which point I would like, like to ask everyone to raise their hands. They're, they're, you're welcome to raise your real hand, but the idea is uh, the uh, electronic hand. I will do my best to keep an eye on the participants lists and follow the hands as they arise. Um, thank you, everybody. And Petra, um, the word is yours. Thank you so much, Giles, and um, thank you for the kind introduction. And also thank you, of course, to the RIA Center uh, to the Institute, to you, to Damien for providing such a very welcoming atmosphere to Leontine Losse, who uh, did a lot of work to help me get here, uh, to Nick and Damien uh, and Dario for doing the technical support, which was sorely needed. Um, so let me actually uh, begin by sharing my um powerpoint with you um and you bear with me while it uploads um i can get started i am very much looking forward to meeting many of you in the next week or so for conversations about your projects for um, all sorts of interesting, interesting projects. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so let me start with the pandemic, uh, which laid bare the tensions between globalization and nationalism in many parts of the world. But those tensions were not new. They had been festering in various incarnations since at least the 1990s, if not earlier. In the United States, recent anti-globalization fervor came in the guise of nationalism, xenophobia, and protectionism, and had been stoked, as you all know, by President Trump long before the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, for instance, when he engaged in economic protectionism and vowed to build a wall to keep unwanted immigrants out. So once the pandemic reached the United States, this nationalist rhetoric and policies only intensified. We witnessed the closing of borders, protectionist policies, and the effort to blame other nations, especially China, 
for bringing the virus into the country. But at the same time, we witnessed the opposite. The intensification of global scientific political coordination to contain the virus and develop a vaccine. This cooperation was and is essential for combating the virus, and it would not have succeeded without a robust transnational network of international scientists and corporations used to working with one another. What I would like to do today is to offer a bit of a longer view of America's relationship with global globalization over the past few decades and discuss some of the ways in which the pandemic might be reconfiguring that relationship. Globalization has come to be seen as both a curse and a cure in the current crisis. As you all know, major crises bring out the best and the worst in people. And so it has been with the global outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. There on one side, the sacrifices of healthcare and other workers who ensured the continued functioning of civil society in the midst of national and international lockdowns, much appreciated by the public and expressed as in, uh, as in the sign uh, in the United States, at least in public displays and messages. Um, of course, Amazon was not far behind chiming in um, trying to make money off of it, um, as they're very good to do, selling an extensive collection of yard signs. One of them uh, is listed here. I looked it up on uh, Amazon for the price of $15 plus taxes and shipping. The sign is yours. On the other side, there were the hoarders and the price gauges, a kind of grassroots entrepreneurship, but not just, that gripped the United States particularly hard. For instance, in the spring of 2020, toilet paper was in short supply and hand sanitizers were nowhere to be found. Within days, private vendors offered them for exorbitant prices on the major online sites like Amazon, eBay, etc. Uh, like the brothers Coleman from Tennessee and one of them you see pictured here. Uh, these brothers had driven around their neighborhood first and eventually as far as Kentucky, which is a neighboring state, to buy up the entire stock of hand sanitizers in dollar stores, stored them in their garage and then sold them online. When Amazon and other online retail sites eventually shut them down, they were actually left with 17,000 bottles and nowhere to sell them. This is all according to an article in the New York Times in March of 2020. So they were very, very quick in trying to make money. On the global stage, similar contradictions stood out. Closed borders, people eyeing each other with suspicion, though these ones here that you see uh, were just having a friendly conversation. This is the border between Switzerland and Germany um, in, in, in Central Europe. Protectionist policies with respect to vital goods such as ventilators and surgical masks. But at the same time, we saw this tremendous global scientific cooperation that became absolutely vital for finding a vaccine against the virus. Without economic globalization, the connection, for instance, between the German lab BioNTech, which developed one of the first vaccines, and the US pharmaceutical giant Pfizer would not have been possible. BioNTech had the technical know-how, but lacked a production and distribution network and the logistics. Pfizer, an American company, could provide that. And another thing is noteworthy in this transnational alliance. BioNTech is a German firm. Its founders, a husband and wife team, Ur Sahin and Özlem Turetsi, are first and second generation immigrants from Turkey. One was born in Turkey and immigrated to Germany at the age of four. The other is the daughter of Turkish immigrants. And while Pfizer is an American company, its CEO, Albert Berla, is not. He is a Greek national who grew up and received his education in Greece. And over the past quarter century, he has lived and worked in several countries before landing in the US. What these biographies do is they tell an important story about the global production of knowledge, global trade, and global scientific networks. Over the past year, 
our radius of mobility had become ever smaller. We couldn't travel across borders, sometimes not even leave our homes. However, in the midst of these closures and retreats, the global persisted, not only in the constantly spreading virus, but also in the scientific research conducted to fight against it. As a historian who has written on globalization, particularly, global, uh, particularly cultural globalization, I was intrigued by these contradictions. I found myself wondering, had we reached the peak of globalization and were we now embarking on a long phase of retreat from global engagement? Or was this a bump in the road on the inevitable march toward global interconnectedness? Was the pandemic offering nationalist protectionists a last chance to rail against the globalist onslaught before the latter emerged triumphant? And I wasn't even sure what kind of outcome I should prefer. Of course, we need global scientific cooperation to find a cure for COVID-19. But globalization had also wreaked havoc on local economies, local autonomies, local cultures. It had created global chain stores, global food emporiums. What should we wish for here? A halt to globalization? Was the alternative the nationalist xenophobic anti-immigrant policies of a Donald Trump, a Viktor Orban, a Jair Bolsonaro, Gerd Wilders, Marie Le Pen? These questions were not unique to the United States, but they were shared by many all over the world. And they indicate how people's attitudes toward globalization had become deeply conflicted. While my focus in this talk is primarily on the United States, the issues I discuss here are present in Europe and other parts of the world as well. And I will refer to those um, other perspectives from time to time. So here's my rough outline of the remainder of the talk. I will first lay out in a bit more detail how the US relationship toward globalization has evolved over time, how it connects to global transformations, how the pandemic has brought out in greater relief what was already problematic before. And at the end, I'll offer some thoughts, very incomplete thoughts, on how globalization might be transformed in the future. And I am eager to hear your thoughts on this as well. So let me start with the first point. Globalization had long benefited America's status in the world before the term was even used among economists in the 1970s. Particularly after World War II, the US emerged as the dominant economic force in the world. And for the next 25 years, it called the shots in the global arena, economically, politically, and militarily. Its main rival, the Soviet Union, was not competitive in the world economy, though of course it presented a political and military challenge within the Cold War context. Beginning in the 1970s, when Cold War tensions declined, the term globalization came to be used extensively as national economies became increasingly entangled and multinational enterprises proliferated. The United States and Western Europe welcomed the gradual expansion of trade relations into Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe, and not surprisingly, since the world's strongest economies stood to benefit the most from these, this expansion holding a competitive edge over smaller corporations and producers in Eastern Europe and the global south. Globalization emerged in tandem with neoliberalism, with its embrace of free trade, reduction in economic regulations, and shrinking of social safety nets. Margaret Thatcher in the UK started this trend in the 1970s. She found an ally in Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, and then something curious happened. As more liberal politicians replaced these conservative ones, Bill Clinton in the US, a Democrat, Tony Blair in the UK, member of the Labour Party, Gerhard Schröder in Germany, member of the Social Democrats, they continued the neoliberal trend through domestic policies and international agreements, agreements such as NAFTA and GATT, the General Agreement on Trade, uh, Tariffs and Trade. They created the World Trade Organization and they met in cozy Davos for, World Economic, for the World Economic Forum every year. These agreements and meetings produced some uneven results. They made the international exchange of goods cheaper and faster. 
They increased the volume of global trade and invited new members into exchange, for instance, China, uh, which became a leading producer of consumer goods for the American retail market. Not only buying and selling became globalized, production itself was becoming globalized. Parts of a whole manufactured in several countries and assemble, assembled in places that were far removed from the business headquarters of a corporation. Apple, for instance, is a prime example. We all know that this process is responsible for the fact that we can now buy t-shirts for six euros and 99 cents at H&M. In fact, I just researched this yesterday and uh, it is indeed possible to buy a t-shirt for this little money. Right here in Middleburg. Yet these agreements also failed to protect, protect labor regulations, allowing corporations to move from high wage labor markets with lots of social protections to low wage markets, thus putting pressure on governments to ease labor regulations and labor laws. Critics emerged as soon as the globalization trend accelerated. For instance, Ralph Nader and others published a book in 1993 entitled The Case Against Free Trade. Some of you might also remember the large protests at the WTO meetings in Seattle, uh, in 1999 and the G8 meeting in Genoa, Italy, two years later. The protesters consisted of a mix of advocacy groups, some from the international labor movement, others concerned about environmental de degradation and still others anti-capitalist. The international media were quick to label these activists anti-globalization protesters, though their opposition focused primarily on the neoliberal aspects of economic globalization. Embedded in the policies of the World Bank, the IMF, and the world's leading economic powers. Protesters charged that the policies advocated by these economic powers, particularly free trade and economic deregulation, gave an unfair advantage to the world's richest economies, crushed local businesses and increased economic dependency of the global south on the wealthy north. In short, this looked an awful lot like a reincarnation of imperialism of the post-colonial sort. They also argued that wages in the US would decline since labor was so much cheaper abroad, particularly in the global south. It was in fact impossible to produce a $6.99 t-shirt in the United States. Manufacturers were likely to move production to places like China, India, or Vietnam, triggering a vicious cycle of higher unemployment and lower wages in the United States. An apparent paradox of these pro protests was that it was global connections that made this anti-globalization movement more powerful, which is why anti-globalization might not quite be as fitting a term for these movements as contemporaries had assumed. By working transnationally and globally, these opponents of neoliberally inflected globalization availed themselves of the global connections that had been established, but used them against what they saw as the unfair and unjust consequences of economic globalization. Therefore, the movement has also been alternatively called the global justice movement or counter globalization movement. These efforts gave an early indication that the struggle over globalization was not as simple as pro and con. It increasingly became a debate over how the process unfolded and who the winners and losers were. More importantly, those complexities and contradictions led to shifting positions and changing allegiances. So let me get to the second part. Over the past 20 years, a lot has changed, shaking up the demographics and political arguments of the critics of globalization. It seems almost as if the positions had flipped. Progressives are still protesting the economic effects of neoliberal policies in the global arena, but they're pushing at the same time for global labor laws, for global environmental regulation, for global sustainability. In short, they embrace a different kind of globalization. Instead, the strongest opposition to globalization now comes from conservative populists in the global north. 
It is found in rural areas that have seen a decline in manufacturing. Workers, mostly white, who blame globalization for the loss of their jobs, favor restrictions on immigration, and have embraced a kind of cultural nationalism that rejects cultural, religious, and ethnic diversity. Donald Trump wrote into the White House in 2016 on the coattails of that populist, anti-globalist sentiment. His slogan, you see here, Make America Great Again, while not exactly anti-globalist, nonetheless attacked some recent consequences of globalization. So what were those consequences? How did Americans end up on the losing side of globalization? Or rather, why did so Americans come to believe that they were on the losing side of globalization? The reality is that some Americans were still reaping the benefits of globalization, but many others were not. The global economy has gone through some dramatic transformations in the past 20 years. The older industrial economies of Europe and North, Europe, North America and Japan now faced increasing competition in the manufacturing sector from younger industrial economies, such as China and India. China, in fact, was emerging as one of the fastest growing economies already before the end of the 20th century. It had a rate of growth averaging 9% per year between 1980 and 2000. From close to zero in 1980, Chinese export trade was accounting for 1.8% of the world's total in 1990. And in 2016, it surpassed the United States as the world's top exporter. As you can see in this chart, I hope you can see it, um, it now stands at over 16% compared to 10.6% for the United States. China's foreign currency reserve, a test of how well a country is doing in the international balance of payment, already recorded $30 billion in 1990 and rose to $4 trillion in 2014, the highest of any country. Countries like India and Brazil were not far behind, although their rates of economic growth remained lower. And after the end of the Cold War, Eastern European countries entered the global arena as well, taking advantage of new opportunities afforded by economic liberalization. Some of the formerly socialist states did better than others. For instance, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic made a fairly successful transition to the market economy, whereas Russia's economy shrank by 3.5% in the first decade after the Cold War. So what does all of this means. It means that the United States, Japan, and the Western European countries now had to share the global market stage with newly competing globalizing economies. However, and this is an important point to make, such nation-by-nation -nation description of accelerating globalization is somewhat misleading. One has to recognize that the principal units playing a role in the world economy were no longer just nations. A major effect of economic globalization at the end of the 20th century was the relative decline in the role of states in determining economic activities. Agency rested increasingly with non-state actors and individuals. This phenomenon had already become noticeable in the 1970s, but accelerated in the 1990s and early 2000s. So instead of focusing exclusively on the rise of China or the entrance of Eastern European states into the global economic arena, we have to look to the increasingly open flow of goods, capital and labor across national boundaries. And we have to look at who benefited from this free flow and who paid the price for it. For instance, while the Chinese state economy created conditions that facilitated economic growth, it was individual Chinese entrepreneurs, as well as profit-oriented firms, that made Chinese goods competitive on the global market. These were people and organizations that happened to be Chinese, but their roles were not bound by territorial borders. They moved all over the world in search of business opportunities. And this is where we now return to those rural Pennsylvanians, Ohioans, Texans who became disillusioned with economic globalization, 
turned against immigration and voted for Donald Trump. Because the winners and losers were no longer defined by the nationalities as Chinese, Indians, Americans, or Europeans, the winners were large global corporations. The losers were workers, rural populations, in short, people whose wages were no longer rising, who lost social medical services, who could not afford to send their kids to college anymore because the cost had become astronomical. In short, whose opportunities for upward mobility had disappeared. They were stuck. But what those Americans often did not realize that was that the poor were stuck everywhere in the world and the rich became richer everywhere in the world. Trump convinced his supporters that their misery was a result of the Chinese, which was maybe partly true, but not entirely, or of Mexicans coming into the country illegally. He did not tell his supporters that it was people like him who shared responsibility for their stagnation, that it was policies such as the hollowing out of the social safety net, the decrease in regulations or the labor policies in agreements with like Na in agreements like NAFTA that had created the conditions for the decline in living standards of low income Americans. And maybe at this point I should stop and point to the sites, to the poster behind me or the picture behind me, uh, one of the uh, four freedoms, the freedom of want from Franklin Roosevelt. This decline in living standards was not just a phenomenon in the United States. It occurred across Europe and Latin America as well, which is why populist ultranationalists. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nick is just helping me with the tech. Uh, populist, ultranationalist, xenophobic parties have been on the rise everywhere, led by charismatic leaders who rile up masses with inflammatory speeches and who do not shy away from bending or in many instances denying the truth just to spread fear and suspicion among their populations. Brexit in 2016 was a result of this phenomenon, an apparent turn away from globalization. And so were the rhetoric and policies of political leaders such as Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, and the political parties such as the National Rally Party in France, led by Marine Le Pen, the AFD, the Alternative for Germany in Germany, the Forum for Democracy here in the Netherlands, the Freedom Party in Austria, or the Northern League in Italy. Their platforms share certain common elements, including an anti-immigration stance and the turn away from international trade and political structures. The Trump slogan, America first, could be and was in many cases replicated in each of these countries. And then came the pandemic, and it changed everything and nothing. The rapid spread of the COVID-19 virus across the world appeared to confirm all the negative aspects of globalization. A map of the early hotspots in the spring of 2020 could be mistaken for a map of the parts of the world that were most connected to the global marketplace. In short, globalization meant the easy and fast spread of the disease. The more your people traveled, the greater the chance of catching and spreading the virus. It did not take Trump long enough long to rename COVID the China virus. It did not take him long to transform the rhetoric concerning the migrants wanting to enter the United States at the border with Mexico from spreading crime and plotting terrorist attacks to bringing COVID into the country though neither was true. Despite blaming China, Trump was slow to shut down all traffic between China and the United States. And as the Center for Disease Control later determined, the strain most prevalent in the US actually did not come from China, but from Europe. New York City was hit particularly hard in the early phase of the pandemic, and it was here that the contradictions of globalization emerged in stark relief for all who cared to look closely. 
The disease was brought into the city by international business travelers who had been jetting among cities, countries, and continents. They were the ones most connected and constantly interacting with a global network of partners. But the ones who ended up dying from the disease came in disproportionate numbers from other population groups, the poor, the aged, the chronically sick, and ethnic minorities. In other words, the pandemic mirrored in macabre ways not only the path of globalization, but also separated out the winners and losers of globalization. The losers were at much higher risk of dying from the disease than the winners. And the winners had much better means to protect themselves from exposure. And this includes most of us in the audience, including me. Many of us in managerial service or corporate jobs could simply work from home. We did not lose our jobs. In fact, some made more money during the pandemic without endangering their own health. For instance, Bezos. Most of my neighbors did not even go to the supermarket anymore. They had their groceries delivered. In other words, they paid some money, probably too little, for someone else to expose themselves to the risks, to the risk they themselves were unwilling to take. They applauded healthcare and other essential workers who restocked the shelves at the grocery store, who cared for the old and the sick, but they did not stop long enough to think about the injustice of exposing the poor to the virus while they sheltered behind the thick walls of their own abodes. They hired private tutors for their children while the supermarket worker had to leave her kids alone at home because not only was she unable to pay for online tutoring so her kids could keep up with the schoolwork, she could not even afford, no less find, a babysitter to look after them. To be sure, the inequalities were much more pronounced when we compare Europe and the US to countries in the global south. But nonetheless, what the pandemic laid bare for everyone to see was that inequalities ran right through every society, every city, every community. These inequalities had existed for a long time, but there's no doubt that the gulf between rich and poor had become more pronounced since the 1970s, exacerbated by the confluence of neoliberalism and globalism. All this also helps explain why protest movements like Black Lives Matter, Matter in the US broke out into the open in the midst of the pandemic. The killing of black and brown people by the police revealed yet another layer of these inequalities, and they became inextricably linked to the pandemic. The movement and the protests spread to Europe, not just as a sign of sympathy with the American cause, but to highlight similar forms of discrimination against minorities in the largely homogenous countries of Northern Europe. The pandemic shut down global travel, Skies emptied out, global business contracted at an unprecedented level. Mobility became restricted as nations closed their borders, as communities imposed curfews, and as citizens were prevented from even leaving their homes for anything other than running essential errands. It appeared that globalization had moved into reverse gear. People rediscovered the local, appreciated the neighborhood, hunkered down, the air became cleaner, something you could even see from space, I hear. But it also turned communities and states against one another. The virus was blamed on others, and a new and uglier kind of nationalism resurfaced, with countries hoarding resources, not just individuals, as I pointed out earlier, prohibiting the export of certain vital goods, and later, when the first vaccines became available, striking exclusive deals with vaccine manufacturers that privileged, yet again, the rich countries over the poorer ones. But we can also look at globalization during the pandemic from a completely different vantage point, not as a curse or cause of the pandemic, but as its cure. For despite all of the nationalist fervor that has been spreading over recent months and years, really, there existed a fundamental understanding that unless the nations worked together, the pandemic would not disappear, but would simply recirculate in an endless loop of waxing and waning. Hence, we're beginning to see glimpses of closer cooperation among scientists and international labs, 
that produced a host of new vaccines in the span of months rather than years. We have seen fund, state funded investments in research, not just domestically, but internationally, but here too, with some nasty side effects, like when Trump, I don't know whether you remember this, tried to convince a German lab, CureVac, to relocate to the US and give the US exclusive rights to the product and the German government intervening in an attempt to block the deal. Interestingly, CureVac is still not producing a uh, viable vaccine. They say they're close though. And while there exists not yet a centralized agency to coordinate healthcare testing and vaccination on a global scale, really the World Health Organization would have been the logical agency to undertake it. There are signs of cooperation, most recently in the pledge of the G7 countries to make available 1 billion vaccines for poorer nations. Prime Minister Johnson at the closing of the summit meeting held in the UK until just last Sunday declared that countries were rejecting, and here I'm quoting him, uh, some of the selfish nationalist approaches that marred the initial global response to the pandemic. Whether this is window dressing or a real turning point in the pandemic remains to be seen. I love this picture um, with lots of gray and black clad men and then two women on the side. Um, and I'm proud to say both of them are German. Um, all right, let's look ahead. Um, there's no doubt that the pandemic has hit the pause button on economic globalization, especially the one forged in the neoliberal mold that had emerged triumphant in the 1990s. What it marks a permanent reset remains to be seen. And if it is a reset, the question will be which direction the world community or individual countries will choose. Will they retreat into nationalist xenophobic protectionist policies? or will they retool the globalization process to ensure greater economic and social equity and greater coordination to tackle some of the larger problems in the, th that the world is facing? Problems that cannot be tackled by one nation alone, but require cross-border collaboration. The pandemic was the acute version of such a problem. The climate crisis is the longer version of that problem. Neither the pandemic nor climate gives a hoot about national borders. They can't be stopped at a nation's edge through passport controls or other kinds of physical barriers, as much as Trump might have tried. If Germany spews greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the Netherlands will suffer. If Dutch cows release large amounts of methane into the air, the Belgians will feel it. If Brazilians continue to cut down large swaths of their forests in the Amazon River region, the world will keep getting hotter. Today is a perfect day to make that statement. Globalization can be redirected to tackle these kinds of problems. Globalism is here to stay and can become a mindset that can be put to good use for the well-being of the world's population and the survival of our planetary habitat. It is up to us, the people of this planet, to make that choice. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion and to your questions. Thank you very Thank you much, much. Petra, for, for that. Um, yeah. Very, very sweeping lecture on, on the situation of the United States in, in a global context. Um, very nice how you merged your 